This is it, the final video in our optics series for now. If we come up with other topics based on comments and questions that I see down below, we might come back and start adding to this list. I am considering doing another playlist talking about mounting and leveling uh, and bore sighting, all the sort of stuff that'll actually get you uh, working out at the range. But as far as picking the right scope goes, I think this is the, uh, the end of the series here because we don't just want a scope that's gonna work. We're gonna talk about our rings and mounts today because it's very important how this attaches to the rifle and at what height it attaches to the rifle. So remember, before we pick out rings for this, we need to go back to that original purpose like we talked about in the first video. It's time to start thinking about what our target is, how far away it is, uh, if it's mobile, if it is dangerous, if there are many of them. Uh, that's what went into picking the, the scope here. And now it's time to throw in some of those extra parameters like uh, what is your rifle like? Is it high recoiling? Are you rough on your gear? What kind of terrain are you gonna be dealing with? Are you gonna be you know, out in the brush? Are you gonna be taking your gun to the range and everything's gonna be pretty sedate? Those are some of the things to keep in mind as you're picking out some of the rings that we uh, see here today. And we'll talk about some that are uh, even better than what we have here on the bench, but I can't afford them. Uh, but uh, uh, there are some that have very high reputations. If you're on a budget like I am, there are some wonderful budget options here on the table, and that's what I'm really going to emphasize today. I'm going to show you some ones that'll work out for you guys that uh, you have limited options and you still want to be able to get the job done and do it without damaging your scope. We have a lot of features to consider, so every so often you'll see me take a look at my notes here. But the most important one is going to be our saddle height. We want to make sure that the scope is at the right spot when we are comfortable behind the rifle. So what you can do is before you uh, buy your scope, before you buy your rings, uh, just take your rifle and get into whatever position you're actually going to be firing from. If you are going to be firing while standing, if this is you know a hunting rifle that you intend to use while upright, then get in that position. If you are going prone, get in that position. Close your eyes and go ahead and get as comfortable as you possibly can. Now open your eye and look straight ahead. Look down uh, along the top of your gun. You're probably gonna see some rail or the top of your action, whatever your kind of gun is. You're gonna see the top of it and you're gonna be looking at a certain height right above. What you can start doing now is stacking either pennies or dimes or something else that's kind of thin, maybe some washers, and stack them equally until as you look across uh, the top of that stack, at some point they're gonna overlap. You're gonna be looking just barely at the top of both or they're gonna be slightly occluded, you're not gonna be able to see either of them, that's going to be the perfect height for your scope. And what you can do now is measure the height of that stack of washers or pennies or dimes and get that height and then remove half of the diameter of your scope. Because remember that if this is my perfect height right there with the, uh, just in the middle of the tube, then I'm going to have to take away half of the tube to figure out what the right saddle height is. Saddle height is measured as the distance between the base where it makes contact with uh, whatever uh, base that we have here on the rifle and where the scope fits right here. So we're gonna have maybe 22 millimeters, 18 millimeters. Some of these will start to get really small, some will get taller, and that's gonna depend on what kind of rifle that you have. Keep in mind that there are big differences between different kinds of rifles, so you're not going to have one type of mount that you can swap around between the different ones. It's probably not going to work out that way. This rifle, for example, with its uh, bolt action, it has a rail that sits on top, and its barrel is... there's nothing kind of hanging out over the top of it. This is not what we would really call a flat top. And I can get this scope moved down quite a lot. And the biggest thing to be keeping an eye on is the stock back here. If you have an AR like this one, since we have the buffer tube running back here, the stock sits very high relative to the, uh, the bore line. It's, it's actually higher than the, uh, the, the height of the barrel over here. Uh, so we do have to have a higher scope mount like we're going to get with these uh, AR mounts that you see right here. These hang out somewhere up around an inch if I remember correctly. They have a very uh, high saddle height for a very good reason. And if you have a rifle 
uh, like maybe a match rifle that has a higher comb, then you may need higher rings. It's all going to be based on what your rig is and uh, how your face fits too. Uh, usually I need rings that are just a tiny bit taller than some other folks. They can get theirs a little closer just because of the way that their face is shaped and mine is. Once you have your saddle height figured out, it's time to start thinking about materials. I have some rings somewhere. I couldn't find any here in the scopes that I have here on the bench, but I do have some steel rings and I really don't like them. Uh, I've actually damaged one of my scopes with them because uh, the ones that I had didn't grip quite right. Uh, so I put some scratches in there. And a lot of these also tend to be the two screw type. Uh, there, there's one screw in each side and I much prefer to have a four hole or in some cases maybe with a higher recoiling rifle a six hole like you see right here. Uh, steel rings should be fine. Uh, they've been around forever. Your granddaddy probably has one on one of his uh, old rifles. And yeah, they, they will work. It's just not one that I particularly favor. I go toward the next material, aluminum. Pretty much everything that you see here on the bench has aluminum except for one that is kind of a, a hybrid. Where did I put that? Oh, here we go. Down here. Uh, this is a worn mount in aluminum, but it also has steel sleeves on the inside. It's uh, kind of a, a thin steel material that the bolt actually goes through, the, the actual screws that tighten this down. So that way I'm not going steel into aluminum. It's actually going steel to steel. And then those, uh, those little sleeves in there uh, can uh, kind of take up the abuse there. And uh, these will probably last longer, especially if I accidentally over torque things a little bit. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. We don't want to get into some extreme torque, especially with aluminum. Uh, but yeah, uh, most of the stuff that you see up here is actually we have a, uh, we have weavers, we have uh, this is a zero delta UTG Tasco worn vortex very very common that's how most of this stuff is going to be if you're looking on amazon if you're looking at optics planet i'll put links to my favorites down below as i start to talk through these uh, but these are going to save you a lot of weight especially if they've gone so far as to skeletonize them so you can see here that they have uh, carved out a section here at the top because they didn't necessarily need all of that material up top so you can save a little weight and still have plenty of contact surface you'll see that some of these have four screw holes. Uh, so these Weaver ones right here, these are the uh, Weaver Picatinny Skeletonized, I think they're called. And uh, yeah, we have two screws on each side of each strap. And if we wanted to get into some that uh, might be better for handling recoil a little better, you can get into the six hole ones here. This is just going to have a wider strap overall. It's going to have more contact area. It's going to have more static friction. And when it comes time to take that shot, the likelihood that it's going to move is going to be very low. That's why I don't really like those two uh, screw hole uh, rings that I talked about earlier. I've had some that when properly torqued, the the scope will recoil and i'm talking about just 308 recoil that's not bad and this is a a ring type that we've had with us for a very long time under 30-06 uh, rifle scopes there are some interactions that we might get into and we'll talk about these here in a second but i will point you more toward your four hole or six hole uh, than the two hole i just based on my own experience i don't really like them one way to think about it for those of you that have worked on cars before if you think about your valve cover it doesn't have just two screws to hold the whole thing down and make sure that there's equal tension all the way around. You actually have a whole bunch and you're supposed to be torquing those in a correct order in kind of a pattern to get everything to uh, come down to the right height and have very equal torque between all of them. And it's kind of similar, I think, with the rings here. We want this to have very equal pressure across the entire strap at the, the top of the ring here and it's just going to be a little bit easier to get with your four hole or six hole. There are several different methods that we're going to use to attach rings to a rifle and these could be proprietary like you have the uh, the loophole dovetail uh, or maybe some of the turn in ones where you have uh, kind of little spigots that you push the ring down into and you turn it into place or you kind of tip it into place and then there are going to be some of your uh, more standard rails that you see right here. This is Picatinny, and uh, this is one that has very fixed spaces between each of these notches. The heights are going to be fixed, and most of the rings that you see here on the bench are going to be set up for Picatinny. These Weaver Picatinny uh, rings, 
have a crossbar. You can see this little lug going through. It's actually the bolt that uh, we use to tighten these onto the scope. And this is a stop that fits really neatly into those sections. So that way, under recoil, this isn't around, allowed to slide around and uh, pop off the rifle or move its position and mess everything up. And uh, some of these are going to be weaver standard instead. So make sure that you check. If you have a rifle base or if you have an AR, that's going to have, uh, it's going to have Picatinny. You can use weaver rings. I think these are weaver right here. Yeah, these have a much smaller crossbar and this is actually round right here this will fit into weaver which has smaller gaps between each of these little notches they have pretty much the same height uh, that's not going to be an issue but the difference is the gap between each of these little bumps and if you have the smaller one weaver it will accept weaver but it will not accept picatinny if you have picatinny it will accept both so keep that in mind if you have some weaver rings that you really like you can put it on your picatinny rail and everything's going to be okay there is one other kind of dovetail that you don't want to confuse with the loophole uh, dovetail like i talked about the ones that kind of uh, you sit them on top and then you, you get everything all situated you turn it in it's I'll put a picture here so you can see what it looks like. And there are some others that use a similar uh, setup. But there's another kind of dovetail you might see, and that's going to be for your air rifles and for um, uh, maybe some of your 22 rifles. That's going to be where you see these for the most part. It's a thinner rail. It's not as wide, and it doesn't sit as high. And in a lot of cases, it's not going to have any of these cutouts, so you can have a lug that absorbs recoil. Uh, so your scope has more of a chance to move around on there. That's why it's on low recoiling rifles. So if you are looking for something that's going to fit on there, yeah, look for the word dovetail, but uh, it's going to look a lot like these sort of rings, not those uh, tip off or the uh, uh, those kind of funky little loophole ones. Most of the rings that you see out on the market are going to look a lot like these, and they're going to attach to the rail using either a single bolt like this one uh, with its great big thumb nut, or it's going to have maybe one or two uh, kind of set screws poking in there. It depends on if you, if you mind having things sticking out. This one is actually pretty easy to work with. It's easier to remove if you have a wrench, and some of these can actually get into quick detach, which is something that I particularly really like. If I have a rifle like this one that's designed to just have a scope on top, then okay, something like this is perfect. It's just going to be locked down and it's going to work. But if I have maybe a tactical rifle, uh, something like this, it's nice to have maybe a quick detach method for uh, removing whatever kind of scope that I have on top, especially if I have backup irons. Uh, that's why on uh, one of my rifles, my, my carbine down here that I use for a more defensive setup, uh, this has these quick detach rings from UTG. Uh, these do have some issues. I've talked about these in the past. If you have a lighter recoiling rifle, these are fine. But if you have something that recoils heavier, it's going to possibly damage your base because of the lug that's in there. Uh, it doesn't protrude far enough and it's rounded, so it could possibly damage your bases. Now, I've heard from folks that these have been upgraded recently. Go check them out. Um, I haven't seen any of the new pictures yet, but people have reported buying these and they have a square lug instead. If that is the case, then these rings are the business. I love them. They come back to zero every time. And if I needed to tip this off and get to my iron sights really quickly, all I do is just slap those over, rip the scope off, and I can go to irons. Or I can pop on a red dot uh, like I have on uh, the rifle right now. Some of these others have their own quick detach methods. Uh, this one right here, the Zero Delta. Uh, this is the D-Lock, and this one has, I think, uh, 20 MOA of compensation built into it. Uh, this has these nuts that you can just grab by hand and turn in. And the way that they have set this up, this one is going to have plenty of tension, even just turning these in by hand. Not all of these are going to be exactly that way. Uh, these, they spent a lot of time and money figuring these out, and this is a pretty expensive little mount. Uh, but this one right here, this is a Weaver thumb nut mount. If you have a 223 or something with similar recoil, this will hold in place even just with thumb tension. I have tested this quite a bit. 
if however you have something that has higher recoil uh, like we tried this mount on a, um, a 458 SOCOM rifle and it would start to work these loose so we ended up putting a, a Warren mount on there instead and Warren has a mount that I've reviewed in the past that has some really cool levers as well uh, that one you have yeah, two levers that you can flip over and it's going to snap your one piece mount into place and speaking of one piece mounts uh, that's the kind of thing that you're probably going to want for your AR uh, for a couple of different reasons. You can use regular scope rings on an AR, but if you do have one mount, I think it makes it a little easier to keep everything uh, neatly in place, and I think it can help with some of the issues that we might have with rings. Um, I talked about how those steel rings and maybe some other one-hole rings have damaged some of my scopes in the past by scraping them, um, and here's why. You want to have a lot of contact between the inside of the ring and your scope. The more surface area that you have, the better grip you're going to have and the less movement you're likely to be dealing with. So that's where we get into some of the trade-offs with uh, maybe price tag and quality. As you get down to a certain level, like it may look like you have some, uh, some NC star scope rings that have all the features of the others, but they might not be ground quite right, they might not be very smooth on the inside, and they might not have the right dimensions, among other problems that they will have. Don't buy NC Star. Um, and they're not likely to grip your scope in quite the right way and to grip it without damaging it. Uh, one that I'm going to point out right now is the Tasco 30mm rings. I tested these last year and I think it was just under... I think it was under 308 recoil. It might have been something less than that. And uh, because they are not polished on the inside, there wasn't enough surface area to really grab onto the scope. It was just touching at little, you know, kind of points that were uh, for little promontories inside there. And then the scope would move underneath under recoil and uh, or move on top and it it really tore some gouges into the sides of my scope i wasn't very happy about that avoid tasco avoid nc star if you're looking for budget i would point you toward weaver to begin with uh, these picatinny four hole rings i have had zero issues with they seem to be properly polished on the inside there's plenty of surface area they grip really well and i've never had any of these move on me if you're looking at a one inch tube and you want something that can perform pretty similarly, check out these, uh, well they do have the same sort of thing for one inch, uh, they just have a different name, it's not Picatinny, it's Weaver. So it kind of assumes that you have a, a Weaver set up anyway. Uh, but you have these, these are the quad lock rings and these are ones that I've used under or on 243 especially for a very long time. I think I've done 308 with these as well and uh, they work quite well. Uh, these have two straps instead of having one across the top and you torque down uh, each side individually. Uh, this has yeah, two that you attach and you just make sure that the torque is good there and yeah, these don't really seem to move around much. They, they do quite well and they seem to kind of bend around the scope. So yeah, highly recommended there. But of course uh, you have your, your rings that you're usually gonna use on a scope like this one. But if you go for that single mount on an AR, uh, you do get some extra benefits. You do get that ability to very quickly uh, remove this if you need to, and it's all gonna come off in one piece. And this should be set up to be very precise overall. You're not gonna have any weird differences in height or in you know how they're off on the, the horizontal plane. Sometimes you can run into issues where your rings aren't pointed in the same direction. Maybe there's a little dirt on the rail. Maybe something wasn't ground quite right. Uh, maybe there's just something off with your rings so they're not pointing in the exact same place as each other. And you can usually feel that when you mount your scope into the rings on top of the, uh, the rifle. You're going to feel if it sits very neatly in there or not. But you might run into some times where, with two rings, it doesn't work out quite right. And this is going to eliminate a lot of those potential problems. Another big reason why most guys that are running ARs are going to have a one-piece mount like this one is actually really obvious on this scope right here. You can see that where the rings are attaching, to the scope is offset from where this actually attaches to the base. And that is going to be obvious when you take a look at my uh, 350 Legend carbine right here. 
If I were to have rings attached to this scope with my proper eye relief, you can see that it would be really far forward and I couldn't actually have both rings attached to the upper receiver. One of them would have to be on the handguard and that's not optimal. These don't always line up perfectly neatly and you can't really rely so much on the handguard. I've actually done some interesting tests and I've found that the handguard can be more reliable than you expect. But I still, that's kind of a hokey way to set that up. I don't want to have these attaching to two different things that might actually be in different planes. And as you can see, with this kind of cantilever mount, it's actually still attached to the upper receiver and I'm not actually touching anything on the handguard. One extra feature that I can point out on this worn mount in particular, this one has 20 MOA of compensation built into it. That's a little bit tougher to get into if you have rings. There are some rings that will allow compensation, but they are fantastically expensive. If you want to add another 20 MOA of drop to your scope, you can get one of these. It's going to point the scope downward relative to your bore, and then you can get more adjustment on your turrets and maybe get more uh, range out of your reticle as well. You can take some of those longer shots and you won't have to dial quite as far. If you have a bolt action rifle like this back here, this has a 20 MOA rail and I can just use regular rings with that. But yeah, if you have a flat top, pretty much the only way that you're going to be able to get away with this is to have a, a one piece mount that can add that compensation. All right, now we'll start to get into some of my recommended rings and mounts. I've already kind of pointed out some of these. If you have a larger budget, this Zero Delta D-Lock rocks. Uh, this, with its uh, thumb nuts that you turn in, this maintains its position under recoil no problem. All you have to do is just use thumb tension and it will stick. And this sucker is built really well. It has a nice smooth surface on the inside. Everything about this is very well machined. This is probably lapped before they uh, put the anodizing on it. And uh, whereas some of these others may be just a little bit rougher or uh, they, they may not have that little extra hand touch. Some other ones that are gonna be a little bit on that higher end, this one's gonna be the most expensive on the table by far. You can look at Spur or Tier 1 if you wanna see what uh, prices can really look like. But uh, stepping down in price just a little bit, we have the worn mounts, like I mentioned here. These rock, they are very lightweight. Uh, this is skeletonized all the way around. You can see cutouts here. Uh, there's just little bits of cutout on these, uh, these sections that go forward. It has plenty of stability. It's very strong, but it is also lightweight and uh, very well built. This is another one that even with a higher recoiling rifle like 350 Legend here, I haven't had anything move in that mount. If you're looking for a good mount and you're on a budget, check out the Weaver ones. This is a one incher right here with thumb nuts. Uh, this is a, a zero MOA, so it's a non-compensating. This is gonna be your, your really standard one. But again, lightweight, skeletonized. I can actually see through holes that are in the bottom of this. And we have some holes cut across the top here. Uh, these are very well ground, very well machined. I like these a lot. And like I said, that's most of the rings that I have up here. Most of these are Weaver. So that's the one incher. Here's the 30 millimeter model. And this has a, its own method of quick detach that again, works great. This has one square lug that you can remove if you have to. And then we have these, uh, these round lugs here for the bolts as well. And when you tighten this thing down, it is going nowhere. I've used this on a variety of rifles, everything from 223 to 350 Legend, and I think 6.5 Creedmoor. And uh, I have no problems whatsoever with those mounts. And they might have a couple different mount methods for you. I think they have one that attaches by set screws. You have to use Allen keys to get those in there. It just depends on what you're after. If you want something that's more permanent, or if you want something that you can quick detach. I like quick detach. As far as rings go, again, I am going to point you toward Weaver. Those uh, Picatinny skeletonized rings I have used all over the place here on scopes of all different qualities and price tags. I have it on SWFA, Nikon, Simmons. I have it on the, uh, the Bushnell Match Pro that you see right here. Uh, this is a you know relatively expensive scope, and I have no trouble at all putting this into 25 bucks worth of rings because they do a really good job. Now, if you do have some of your uh, lesser expensive rings, especially, 
And especially as you have a, a higher price scope, you may want to do what's called ring lapping to make sure that you do get full contact. There's no chance of you accidentally crushing something, or at least there's a lesser chance. And you have better grip overall, even with your lower torque, on the, uh, the screws up here. And to do that, you're gonna have to buy some kind of kit. You need a 30 millimeter tube and a, a grinding compound and the ability to spin it in there. And what's it, what that's gonna do is it's gonna fix a couple things potentially. It could make sure that you do have a perfectly straight channel through your rings. If it's off a little bit, it's going to remove some of those high spots and you'll get a nice smooth channel there. And then it's going to increase that surface area so that when it grabs, it's not picking out little points that might scratch or that might just keep it from holding its position overall, it's gonna get a really good grip over the entire surface area. Some other rings that I've tested and can recommend include Vortex that we have up here. Uh, I've used loophole ones before, they're just fine. And then actually on the, uh, the cheap end, if you have a, a one inch tube, and you want something for maybe especially a lower recoiling rifle, I really like these Tasco uh, one inchers right here. Check out how crazy low you can get the, uh, the saddle on this. You can mount these really, really, really low onto a rifle. And uh, if you have a squirrel gun, you want to be able to get that straight down on the bore and uh, it not move around on you and do it very lightweight. These Tascos are actually really good. I talked about the, uh, the worn mounts over here, but uh, we also do have worn rings. And they have a couple different types. Uh, for a long time, we've seen those ones that have the bolt at the top that goes uh, crossways through there. But they also do have these Mountain Tech ones. Uh, I've been trying these out for over a year now, and these are excellent. Uh, these are very finely polished, very well made. You're going to step up the price tag over those weavers, but these just have that little bit of extra something to them. They're very well machined, tight. They lock up really well. The last piece of advice I'll send your way is to buy yourself a torque wrench, especially if you have more than one rifle. The torque is very important, especially on these screws at the top of the rings. You can accidentally crush your scope or you could damage the rings if you go too far. If you have the little wrench that comes supplied with the rings, usually if you use the small end, then that'll get you roughly in the ballpark. You'll be able to hit that 15 inch pounds. But if you can get a torque wrench and nail it, then you're going to preserve the life of your scope and your rings, and you're just gonna be happier overall. Thanks a lot for watching, you guys. If you have any rings that you have used in the past and you love them, maybe you have some that you've had on a rifle for decades, please leave a message down below. Let me know what you use and uh, what your application is, what your rifle is, what kind of terrain, and maybe some of the extreme uh, circumstances that yours have been through and have uh, come out on the other side. If you have run into any that have caused you major problems, also please put a comment down below and let us all know what has happened. I think if we can steer people away from certain things, especially uh, some of the more Chinese products that we can find out on Amazon, uh, the more we can save a lot of heartache. Thank you to patrons of the Destructive Arts for making videos like these possible. They keep the lights on and uh, they keep me able to get out here and test a lot of this stuff. Uh, you know, a fair number of these scopes I have bought, some of these mounts and rings, and uh, yeah, I've been able to test them thanks to you guys and report back. So yeah, if you want to join their ranks, I'll put a link to Patreon around here. Thank you to the 338 Lapua Magnum patrons, uh, Sportsman's Guide, Stan and Mary, and Tyler. And at the 300 Win Mag level, we have Joseph Davis, Peter, Mr. No Name, and Howard. You guys rock, and everybody else that's chipping in a buck or two a month, I hope that it's going a long way and that you've gotten a lot out of this series. We'll get into some other stuff here in the future. This has been a, a kind of a marathon uh, video series right here. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you with whatever we come up with next. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, be sure to like, share, and most importantly, subscribe. Even if you didn't like this particular content, go ahead and subscribe. There's probably something coming that's more up your alley. Check out this playlist right here. This is going to have videos in a similar vein to what you just watched. These two videos we cherry picked for you. And finally, The Social Regressive is on Patreon. So you can become a patron of the destructive arts and earn some goodies while helping us to provide high quality videos just by kicking us a few bucks a month. Thanks a bunch for your patronage.